Be sure to subscribe for a chance to win a $20 Amazon gift card on January 31st. These Native American legends are far more than legends. They might just be the death of you. This world is a strange one. Those that were here before us were wise to the land. It would be our mistake to simply say the scary stories of Native Americans are simply just myths. Back then and often to this day, tribes very much believed in the flesh-eating Wendigo and the trickster Skinwalker. The stories they told served as a warning to their people. Yet today, we foolishly shrug them off as bedtime stories to give us chills. Well, when you wake up in the middle of the night to an inhuman creature outside your window, don't say you were never warned. Here are several allegedly real encounters with Wendigo and Skinwalkers. But first, I want to sincerely thank Bradley V and Arturo M for sending us donations. You guys are the best kind of people. Also, have you seen the Mothman or maybe the Goatman? Oh yes, some upcoming videos will be over them once I get enough stories. So if you've seen a half moth or half goat monster, send me your experience at darknessprevails.org. Thanks. Now, call a shaman. You're gonna need a blessing after this one. Number one, My Monster in the Woods, submitted by Wiki. First, I'd like to say that I'm only sharing this story to gain some more insight on what I've been encountering. Whatever it is, it's easily the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. If anyone knows what this is, I would really appreciate the help. To begin, I live in Northern Idaho, outside of a small town. I have two neighbors out here, but we don't really talk. On days I'm not working, I spend most of my days hiking and fishing so I'm a fairly active person. Anyways, on some of my hikes, about six months ago, I started to find strange looking footprints. I never took any pictures though, because I naturally just waved them off as two or more different footprints overlapping. The footprints looked something like a mix between a deer and a wolf. The back end of the foot would usually have a hoof, but the front would have toes and claws. It was a disturbing sight, but again, I figured it was probably just two footprints overlapping. No normal person would just assume it was some monstrosity lurking about the forest. Maybe a coyote or wolf crossed the path of a deer. Of course, the only red flag that ever came up was the fact that these overlapping footprints would always perfectly line up like that in the same way. By then, my suspicions were high. This continued to happen for several weeks until I stopped seeing them on my hikes. Instead, I began to find them closer to my home, usually by my trash can. This genuinely scared me because at the very least, this meant a wild animal was stalking around my home. There was no way they would get into the trash. And having lived here for almost 20 years, I have a pretty good idea of what the wildlife is like. This continued for about a week until I actually saw the thing that was leaving those footprints. Now get ready, because this is terrifying and bizarre. It must have been six to seven feet tall with what appeared to be a wolf's head. It had large misshapen feet and clawed arms. It looked a little mangy and very agitated. On top of its head, it had two extremely large antlers, almost the size of a typical set of elk antlers. And on its shoulders were a pair of what looked like tattered wings. At the time I saw it, I had just gotten home from work and was about to go out for a hike. After I got ready and I stepped outside, I saw that thing standing near my trash cans, rummaging through them. The worst part was when it saw me. It looked right at me with deep set yellow eyes and it just stared. You know that feeling when something really, really bad is about to happen? That's what I felt. Just as I stopped freaking out and realized that it was real, it started to walk towards me, very slowly, almost shambling like it was injured. Fortunately, I always keep my 44 with me in case of an animal attack during one of my hikes, so I shot it a few times in the chest. It gave a bestial roar and ran off, and to this day, I haven't seen it again. I just want to know what it was that I shot. I know that if I hadn't, 
it would have tried to hurt me, and that doesn't help what I saw. If anyone has seen the same thing, please share your story. It would really help. Number two, Wendigo on the Roof, submitted by Dominicus V1289. Let me just say I'm a sucker for the paranormal. I believe I've had encounters with ghosts, poltergeists, monsters, etc. But this is one of the scariest I've ever had. I have grandparents that I love very much. My mom usually leaves me with them if she is gone for a few days. And one day this happened. I was at my grandparents' place, but I was home alone. It was late, at least 8 p.m. I was sitting there working on my computer doing homework the typical teenager stuff. At one point, I walked downstairs to get something to drink when I heard footsteps. They weren't in my house, but they were outside, and honestly, it frightened me because I had watched too many scary movies lately. I didn't want to be a wuss about it, and I thought, it's most likely my neighbor's dog or something, so I went back to doing my homework. Now, I was doing my homework on the second story, and that's when I saw something in the window. What I saw was no dog. It was black and tall, really tall. I was 11 at the time, five feet tall myself, and this thing was towering, and there was no way I could fight it if it came down to it. I stared at the thing for what felt like the longest minute of my life. Then suddenly, the thing jumped down from where the window was out on the roof to my backyard. Then I heard my grandmother's voice, Domas. Give us a key to the door, we forgot ours. I was still very scared, but I felt relieved. My grandparents were back, so I was safe. But then I remembered, my grandparents locked the door from the outside, so they had to have had the key to do that. And besides that, it was only eight, and they were meant to be back at nine. I grabbed my GoPro with the stick thing attached to it, and I started filming, and I very much regret that decision. When I poked the camera out of the window, whatever was out there took the camera and started pulling me down. I struggled, but he yanked the camera out of my hand. Then I heard that thing outside stomp off into the woods, out of the yard. I thank God that I survived. I wanted to call the police, but I don't think they would believe me. But when my grandparents got home and I told them what happened, they actually believed me. And not too long after, for one reason or the other, they soon moved out. As far as I know now, that place is still abandoned. And honestly, sometimes I miss it. I drop by there every so often, but I always bring protection. Number three, Filled Stalker, submitted by Daniel. What happened that day will haunt me until the day I die. For some background info, I'm a skilled marksman. I've won a lot of shooting competitions. I'm 27 years old, and I'm not your everyday night owl. Sometimes I find myself staying awake for three days at a time. I live in Fairbanks, Alaska, and hunting is my way of life. Wolves, bears, deer, you name it. Two months back, a wealthier guy who owns a private lot of land hired me to guard his land sometimes. He knew of my experience hunting and shooting, but the salary is more than what I deserve. But I took the job anyway, and because of that, I was able to buy a bunch of new gear. I bought an M21 rifle with a bipod and a military-grade scope, a 1911 45 handgun, some night vision goggles, a couple boxes of 7.62 and 45 ammos, and a flashlight. Anyway, this property I sometimes guard is surrounded by fences. I feel so isolated as I rarely see people when I'm on duty. I sleep in a small outpost. Beside the outpost is a watchtower where I spent my time every night. It was the 5th of March when this happened. It was just another night in the office, at least that's what I thought. Around one in the morning, I was at the tower just chilling when I heard a strange noise that echoed throughout the field. I'm not gonna lie, it caught me off guard, so much so that I almost fell off of my chair. What the heck was that? I whispered to myself. I quickly grabbed my rifle and I searched for where the noise came from. It took me a moment to find where the noise was coming from. 
but when I finally found it, my God. About 50 yards away, a freaking humanoid-shaped thing was crawling on all four limbs. It had gray skin and red eyes. I could see its mouth opened, jaw unhinged, rotting jagged teeth. I had no earthly idea what I was looking at. Just seeing this thing scared the living hell out of me, and I thought it couldn't get worse, but I was wrong. The thing was crawling towards my direction, and my brain couldn't comprehend what I was looking at. It then suddenly stopped dead in its tracks. It raised its head, and I could see it sniffing the air. It then went back to crawling. It was too late before I realized my mistake. Just below the tower was the garbage can, and earlier I had forgotten to close it. It must have been the garbage smell attracting the thing. A minute passed, and the thing was only five meters below me. I didn't dare to move or make a sound. My blood was running cold. I was frozen like a statue. About two minutes passed before it lost interest. It crawled back into the darkness, but I stood still for four more hours just to be safe. I waited for daylight, and the moment the sun rose, I didn't waste any time. I immediately jumped down off of the tower, not giving a darn if I broke my leg. As soon as my feet landed, I ran as fast as I possibly could to my car, and I got out of there. Later that day, I called my boss, the owner of the land, and I told him what I saw. What was even more weird was the fact that he didn't act surprised, as if he knew something that I didn't. The sight of that thing haunts me still. After a few days of not showing up due to sleepless nights, I just decided to quit the job. I went back to get my things, and what happened made my insomnia worse. Some nights when I'm alone, I swear that something is watching me. Number four, Deer Watching Me. Submitted by TN Tom. This is one of the most unnerving things that has ever happened to me. Let me start off by saying that I work security on a facility in Southern Tennessee. I can't go into much more detail than that because of what is produced. It's nothing radioactive, but it's dangerous. Needless to say, the place is heavily monitored. Every night for an hour, I go patrol the area, and then I report back to the office, and normally I go home. Well, that night we had trespassers caught on camera, and I was sent out to investigate. By the time I had gotten there, they had already left, and I was ordered back via radio to check out a nearby area that was normally abandoned. As I drove by, I saw a fat baby deer alone in the middle of the field that was next to the road. I didn't think much of it because it was very common to see deer out there. I made a U-turn and I reported back to my office. They told me to go back to that area and close an area gate because another person patrolling had forgotten to. Now, this gate was near the field where I saw the deer before, but it was also where the field met the outlying forest. I drove over got out of my car and instantly felt eyes on me. I tried to ignore the feeling. I was at the edge of the camera range, so I assumed it was from that. As I closed the gate, I looked up, standing on two feet with one hoof at its side, almost like a human arm, was that thing that I thought was a deer. It was peeking up from behind a tree, standing straight up as if it were bipedal. Once I fully realized what I was looking at, I ran and jumped back into my car, threw the thing into reverse, and drove backwards to the main road before rushing home. I don't think I can trust deer anymore, not after seeing whatever that thing was. Number five, Nawales. Submitted by Mr. Balderas. This is a story I was told by my grandmother before she began to lose her memory due to old age. The story begins in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. My grandma during the time was only 19 years old, though now she's in her late 80s. In the town she lived, her dad was an important man and her family was very wealthy, allowing her to live a privileged life. My grandma was aware of this and she at times would feel guilty and bad 
seeing how good she had it and how many Indian tribes there were living in poor conditions or starving. So often, she would go to bring food to the Amerindian kids. From an early age, my grandmother was very interested in the occult, as well as the brujeria, witchcraft, that the Indian tribes practice, though much of it was kept in secret, due to the strict racial division in the Catholic Church. So when she heard about a group of kids at one of the Indians' villages being Nawiles, or skinwalkers, she became overly excited and had to go see them. Apparently, these kids would transform into animals or into weird animal-human hybrids for food or cash. When my grandmother did arrive with food and gifts, she asked the children, has la sarita, or do the little fox. Hearing her request and seeing that she had gifts, three of the five kids before her eyes transformed into foxes while the other two transformed into lanky humanoid figures with foxes' heads. As a little girl, she found this to be cute and adorable, so she made it a habit to come and visit them often. She then found out there was many other Nahueles living in the village, some even in her own town. Some weren't full native, but mestizos like her. She then found out some people were born Nahueles, while others learned how to do it through a process of animal blood and rolling in dead people's ashes. Over the years, the Catholic Church gained more power and the government became more corrupt and racist, and they drove many of the Indian villages towards the mountains and countryside and away from the townsfolk. Therefore, the Nahueles left as well. I've always been interested in seeing one myself, and I've read that during the colonization of Latin America, the Aztec Empire would use Nahueles in their army to sneak into conquistadors' camps at night and kill them during their sleep. Number six, Tree Hopper. Submitted by Night Master. When I was younger, I lived in the woods of Australia I was a little more than three years old when this story happened. My older brother, we'll call him Josh, he would always say that he could see a man in the tree at the back of our wooden cabin. We had a big backyard and it was surrounded by lots of big pine trees. He said there was a man. He would just sit at the back in one of the big trees and my brother would always go and talk to him. No one else could see him though. The next day, my brother said he had hopped trees and he got closer to our house. It was one tree a day. My mom was a very superstitious person. She believed in spirits, ghosts, and demons. She always said that this man would never hurt us. And I guess to some extent, she was right. I never liked him. I got a very strange feeling about this man. And even to this day, I still get shivers thinking of him. One night, one of my mom's friends who she had been fighting with lately called her up in a panic. She exclaimed that she had a dream and she said to not let us boys go down near the creek alone, the one that we live next to. She said that in this dream, some man pushed my brother into the water and began to drown him. My mom believed her and said that we shouldn't talk to this man ever again. Not too long after, my brother told me that it was making the man very angry, that he had said he would make us sorry for her actions. Later that week, we had run out of firewood, so my dad, brother, and I went down to get some. My dad started cutting some wood, and the only spot that had good firewood we could actually use since it had been raining was close to the creek. He said that he would watch out for my brother, making sure he'd never lose him out of sight, and paid very close attention to him. When he was cutting the wood, I suddenly heard a strange noise coming down by the water. I had the urge to walk over there, as any innocent three-year-old would do. I was walking down to the creek, and I was near my dad, but as he was busy and trying to focus on my brother, he had no idea that I had walked off. I got to the edge and was standing there when I felt something sharp like claws push me close to the edge and the ground broke. I fell into the water. My dad was keeping such close attention to my brother to make sure that he didn't fall in, but it ended up being me who fell in. My dad luckily heard me go in and he rushed over, jumping in the water. 
He quickly pulled me out of the freezing water. It would have been 24 degrees in there. My dad grabbed my brother and me and we ran back home. I thankfully wasn't hurt too much, just a few scratches. We shortly moved after that due to other supernatural experiences in the house. Not to mention it was nearing bushfire season and the fire was expected to pass around our home. But with the massive pine trees nearby, we just couldn't take that risk. Ever since then, we have never seen that man again. And I hope to never feel the gaze of someone piercing through our curtains. Whether it was a guardian angel who sent my mom's friend that dream or what, I am grateful that we were warned. And to that creepy skinwalker demon thing that hopped the trees, let's never ever meet again. Number seven, Skinwalker at the Window. Submitted by Cody T.S. This is a true experience from my childhood. I must have been around the age of 10 and my little sister the age of nine. Since I was so young, my parents and every other adult I would go to with these stories for help they would say I had a childish, overactive imagination. It wasn't so bad in the beginning. The things that usually happened were like hearing noises at night and basically freaking myself out, but I didn't wanna sound so afraid, so I didn't tell anyone. No, I didn't ask for any adult's help until my little sister started seeing things that I couldn't. She would say that these black figures would come to her window at night. They would be screaming at her to let them inside whispering amongst themselves something that she could not understand. She would come to me and tell me her friends wanted to stay and that I should not lock the windows at night or they would be very, very mad. Obviously, I didn't listen. I kept all the windows and doors locked in this little house in the woods. Hearing that from my sister did nothing but creep me out. Years passed with my sister saying she saw these black figures and I would laugh and make fun of her something I did to hide my own fear, all until the point I had my first encounter with them. I wasn't so sure what to call this tall, black, disfigured thing, but who could ever forget the glowing, frosty, white eyes of this creature? And my sister began to open her window at night. The sliding of the glass panel would wake me up, and after a while of arguing to no avail, I just left it alone. But the next morning, I would wake up to my sister asking me why her friends were standing over me, about how soft and delicious my skin looked to them. Shortly after that, I started locking my door, and I would not come out of my room until it was daytime. This shortly changed after I heard scratching on the old wooden door leading to my room. I could hear voices telling me bad things. Unlock the door. Let us in. We won't bite very hard, they would say. But after that, my sister started unlocking the doors again after I locked them. And then things got worse. She started to wander outside to the old trail in the woods. One night, I followed her while she was sleepwalking. At least, that's what I thought she was doing. Until one day, when I followed her, she stopped. We were in the middle of the woods, and she pointed up at a tall, black figure. It had white, glowing eyes. On all fours, this thing was chewing on something. My sister screamed, and the thing rose up to a tall, slender being on two feet. Without hesitation, I grabbed my sister's arm, and we ran back into the house, locking every door and every window when we were inside. Eventually, after two long years of being in fear, we started to block out these sightings and tried to live normal lives. And we haven't seen these creatures ever since. Number eight, It Comes at Night, submitted by Hannah P. This happened about a year ago. Here's a little background about my neighborhood. My house and the others are all set in a circle, a perfect circle where people just built on, not knowing what was ever there before, which I later found out it was built on top of a Native American burial ground. Of course, they just kept building, 
And we've all seen our fair share of horror movies where building on ancient grounds is a huge mistake. Sometimes my closest friend and I will walk around the neighborhood, usually at night, because it's the only time she wasn't busy. We would talk about little things such as work, boys, books, TV shows, anything that made us happy really, and that usually made us comfortable. We would always walk past a soccer field connected to the circle. A thick wall of trees surrounded us on all sides, but if you walked through the field, there would be an old dirt path. Michelle and I were really the only ones who would walk it, and probably the only ones who knew where it was. Once in a blue moon, we would walk down that path at night, but we would get scared and run back due to the growing feeling of anxiety and danger. And you couldn't walk around the circle alone because you would always look behind you. You could feel something right behind you at all times. One night while I was home alone, my little brother was over at a friend's house and my parents were on a vacation, so it was just me and of course my giant rabbit Callie. She was like a little guard dog and was the size of an English bulldog, so she was probably the most intimidating rabbit you've ever seen. Whenever she felt something was wrong, she would stomp and would growl, and I mean growl. She rarely did this and it was only if my brother and I were fighting. At the time, my window blinds were open and the sun was starting to set. I turned on my back porch light just in case Michelle was to come over. She was prone to using the back door just to scare me. My rabbit was chilling in the middle of the floor. My couch was on the opposite wall of the windows, so I had a clear view. An hour or two passed and it was dark, but my backyard was pretty well lit. I was just playing video games and trying to relax. Callie jumped up and started to thump, and I immediately knew what that meant. I started to wonder what was wrong. She stood on her back legs and looked out the window, thumping again. I thought it was Michelle, so I called her on my phone. She picked up right away. I spoke very annoyed. Stop trying to scare me and just come inside. You're making Callie really on edge. There was a long pause before she finally replied. I'm still at work, Hannah. Chills ran down my spine as she said it. Callie started to grunt and growl, thumping more constantly and looking out the window. Then, as I looked back at the window, I realized something. My back door light was on, but the light wasn't going through the window. I started to panic. Whatever was covering the light soon opened the door and came inside. Callie backed up a little. I started to snap photos with my flash on, but none of those photos showed the thing in front of me, but I could still make out what I was seeing. It was a thin figure with barely a face but it had defined cheekbones and a ridge that went down its forehead. I screamed at whoever it was, telling them to go away. I ran into my room to grab a thing of sage. I kept it just in case of something like this ever happened, a little bit of preparedness for living on Native American burial grounds. As I ran downstairs, it was in my living room. Its cold, faceless gaze was right on Callie. I ran for my kitchen and turned on the stovetop. It was just clicking, then boom, the flames roared, putting the sage stick into the flames and blowing it out. I recited the old Native American prayer that my grandfather and father taught me growing up, and then out of nowhere, poor Callie was thrown across the room. I panicked and saw it wasn't working, so I ran out of my house through my front door and ran into Michelle. I was just blubbering and crying, saying things like, it's in there and it's trying to kill me. So we both ran inside and instantly saw nothing. Callie was just lying on the floor, panting and scared, her little nose twitching a million times a second. Michelle doubted my story, and then I began to describe this thing's face, peering through the thick black mass that was seeping slowly into the living room. Even she looked scared after that. She slept over and Callie stayed by our sides. We barely slept that night but little did I know it wouldn't be the end. And I still have no idea what this thing was. I've been scratched and pushed out of nowhere, and I can't sleep in my own room due to an overwhelming feeling of being watched. Michelle has had things thrown around her house and scratch marks on her walls, ceiling, and also the furniture. The fight isn't over and probably won't stop until we move or we put an end to this. Cultures all over the globe share legends terribly similar to those of the Skinwalker and Wendigo. They tell tales of men 
who can change into animals, tales of cannibals who become insatiable monsters. Why would so many different regions of the planet tell the same stories if there wasn't some truth behind them? Maybe it's something we don't want to be sure of. Evidence of monsters just might mean you'll become their next meal. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget, send me any Mothman and Goatman story you have at darknessprevails.org. Thanks.